I'm Dan Snow, and I've come to China to investigate the single largest burial site on Earth. Starting with its greatest treasure, the Terracotta Army. That is one of the most wonderful views in the world. Over a thousand warriors guarding their ruler for eternity. With the possible exception of the Great Wall, there's nothing more Chinese than these warriors. And yet, a new theory suggests that this great icon of China may be guarding an explosive secret. New evidence suggests that the inspiration for all this could have come from the West. There's a possibility they really have some other culture stimulation. That is such an important idea. The person who made that had an understanding of anatomy. That is extremely surprising. It's often thought China grew up isolated from the West until Italian explorer Marco Polo came here in the 13th century. But if we could prove that wrong by a thousand years, it would rewrite the history books. To help in my search, I'm joined by two expert investigators, Alice Roberts and Albert Lin. As our medical scientist, Alice will be examining any human remains buried here. This doesn't look like a typically East Asian skull. Albert will use the latest imaging technology to try and find the first roads joining East and West. If I'm right, then what I'm standing on right here could be one of the roads built by the first emperor and I'll be interrogating the secrets of the Emperor's mausoleum, looking for the traces of Western technology. Oh, look at that! That's fantastic. Together, we'll be exploring an extraordinary possibility that East and West were connected far earlier than anyone thought possible. And that connection changed the face of China. This is the starting point for our investigation. One of the most hallowed sites in all of China. The burial grounds of the first emperor. Oh, yeah. That, according to legend, is the first emperor's tomb. Albert is setting out to survey the entire burial site by climbing the tomb. In over 2,000 years, no one has been inside this sacred earth pyramid. It's pretty incredible. The emperor's tomb is right beneath my feet. He was buried in 50 meters below the surface of this mound. And the Chinese government has decided to protect it further by denying access to the public. It's like being on top of Tutankhamun's tomb, but not being able to get inside. Maybe for good reason. Nobody really knows what's in there. Even from the top of the overgrown tomb, there's only one way to see the surrounding site. OK, let's go. Nobody's ever been allowed to fly here. This is unprecedented access. The nearby hills are studded with top secret military installations. And it's taken us months of negotiating with the Chinese army to get permission to do this. But once in the air, it's clear it was worth the effort. Look at that, it just keeps on going, it just expands. The exterior walls of the mound are over there. At 100 square kilometers, this is the biggest burial site on Earth. 200 times bigger than Egypt's Valley of the Kings. Can you imagine 
building this for yourself? For your afterlife? And that's just what's visible on the surface. Beneath these fields, archaeologists have uncovered a vast buried world of more than 600 pits and structures. Each one a gold mine of archaeological riches. Almost every day there are new discoveries, and we have unprecedented access to them. Anyone could potentially link China to the outside world in the 3rd century BC. This was the era of classical ancient Greece, a time it was always assumed when China existed in total isolation. That assumption started to crumble because of the first discovery they made here, the Terracotta Army. It's not these buildings over here. It's the building, it's that one, it's the one beyond. The Terracotta Army lies a kilometer and a half away to the east. Today, it's one of the biggest tourist attractions on Earth. But few people realize this extraordinary collection of figures contains one of the greatest unsolved mysteries in China's history. No one has ever been able to explain their origins. The mystery began when all this was farmers' fields. And one of those fields yielded a life-size terracotta head. It was 1974. Look at that. So what's happening here? This is um, right at the beginning of the excavation, I presume. So that's you? Yeah. yeah. <laughs> Fantastic. 42-year-old Yuan Zhongyi was the first archaeologist sent here from Beijing. What was the thing which most surprised you? Yuan's first week here turned into decades. And today I'm coming to meet the person who's continuing his pioneering work. His former assistant, Janice Zhujin Li. Hi, Janice. Like, yeah, hi. How are you? I'm fine, how are you? Very good. Okay. They believe the Emperor's Terracotta Army is an exact copy of the real thing. Oh, so this was going to yeah. be, these were going to be his army yeah, in the afterlife? Yeah, in the afterlife, wow. to protect him. What I really noticed looking around is I think they all look different. I can't see any two that are the same. Some of them have got a bit of a belly on them. Some of them are very, very tall. Uh, were they all individually crafted? They're really quite individual. You see the moustache is different, and also the eye shape. This stunning realism amplifies the great mystery surrounding these figures. Where do they come from? Because they're nothing like any figure made in China before them. Let me show you the terracotta figures made in China before the Qin terracotta okay. work. So the figurines is really small. Okay. In small size, about 10 inches. Oh, so tiny. So that's very tiny. So and that, suddenly yeah, they start producing yeah, this. And this about two meters. So something has changed. Yes. These warriors are far more sophisticated, much bigger and much more realistic. Yeah, much more details. But were they all made in China? Yeah, let me show you the stamps here. This is the name of the artisan. So this character warriors is produced locally. The big question is, how did Chinese craftsmen achieve such an incredible transformation? 
like going from a stick man to a Leonardo in a single step. Something remarkable happened here 2,200 years ago. To understand quite how remarkable, I need to put it in a global context. The world at the time of the first emperor, around 220 BC. Over here, right on the eastern edge of the Eurasian landmass, you've got the, Ch the Chinese world, a competing cluster of mini-states over there. Over on the west of Eurasia, you've got the Roman Empire starting to expand over here, and you've got Greece over there. Now, what's going on artistically in east and west is very different in the third century. This is classic Greek art, absolute high watermark of artistic expression, beautiful, metre and a half tall, intricately painted, human in its look. But over here, in the Chinese world, as Janice has showed me, you've got that just centimetres tall, far more basic. Then something changes. In fact, everything changes. There's a revolution. Suddenly, in 220 BC, and just, just after that, you get the terracotta warriors, light years ahead of what's gone before. It starts to look far less like its predecessor and far more like what's going on in the Western world. Both life-size, both life-like, attempts at realism using paint and the sculpture to reflect the realities of the human body, the human form. And this couldn't be more important because it's always been assumed that China developed in isolation. But if that's not the case, if the first emperor of China imported Western ideas and techniques to create his extraordinary necropolis, well, that forces us to completely rewrite the history books. If you're going to rewrite the history books, you need evidence. <laughs> you need a lot of evidence. And I think there isn't enough evidence just for the terracotta warriors. This is a theory that turns on its head centuries of thinking about the relationship between China and the West. You can't just, you can't just base it all on one statue. It just seems that there are so many mysteries associated with this place. Yes. It's phenomenal. It just feels as though there's an awful lot more to be discovered. There is a history, Chinese history, so maybe there's a lot to the stories that were written in this, in this historical text. It's oh, amazing to have those texts as well. I mean, how fantastic. OK, this is it. It's called the Shiji. We got 20 pages of a, of a text that was written over 100 years later <laughs> by the first Chinese historian called Sma Qian. He talks about the first emperor's tomb, but he doesn't even mention the terracotta warriors. They don't even get a mention. You know, what is now one of the most important sites on Earth doesn't even get a mention in this. And he, unfortunately, he doesn't mention foreigners or, or people from beyond Central Asia. So there wow. are gaps in the history. There's ga big gaps in the history. So we're relying on you guys. Well, you know, the extent of this place is huge. So what we're looking at actually here is the main burial mound. Uh, and the terracotta warriors are pretty far off uh, to the east side of the entire burial complex. Uh, and, you know, what I think is the interesting question is, is there a road network that extends from this? Do you think you could ever find connections with points further west? It's hard to say because it's going to go, uh, you know, obviously the roads meander and turn over time. But I think what's exciting is if we can start to use different technologies and maybe we can start to see the traces of where these roads were going from this one very important place, obviously. I'm really interested to know if there's anything else here in terms of the archaeology, in terms of the material culture that could point to a Western influence or a, or a Western connection, or indeed, you know, any evidence of Westerners ever having been here. The assumption, I think, is that this whole site was built, what, in 10 years or so, is that it right? Was very fast, yeah. And so it seems like the evolution of the material and the types of artistry that was created over time is, is pretty remarkable from the beginning How to the end. How it could just spring right? into being with no tradition of it at all. So far, our only evidence lies in the terracotta warriors themselves. If they were created with some kind of outside influence, can we find traces of it in the way they were made? To find out, Alice and I are going to take a pottery lesson. 
we found an instructor, Mr Han, who runs a factory producing replica warriors. He's also studied how the originals were made over 2,000 years ago. What do you do with this? Are we building it up? Apparently the bodies are not sculpted, but made with the kind of coil pot technique most of us have tried at school. Looking at the ranks of terracotta soldiers, it's clear their bodies are variations on standard shapes, with arms, legs and torsos made up of a series of clay cylinders joined together. Ooh, we're building it out, aren't we? OK. And I suppose, really, when it comes down to it, I mean, and I know this is an unusual type of pot, but it really is just a big coil pot, isn't it? What gives each warrior its sense of real, distinct character is the head and the face. And again, it's all about ease of production. The mould, we got it. This makes more sense. Moulding makes sense to me. Right, one, two, three. Yes, this is art. In fact, making the head turns out to be even easier than the body. And it seems anyone with a bit of practice could produce heads pretty quickly using this moulding technique. Oh, look at that! Look at that! That's fantastic. Oh, nose needs a little bit of work there. There's something really magical about putting a lump of clay into a mould like that and then suddenly what you've got is a face looking back at you. Brilliant. The key to this is the original head from which the mould was made. Someone had to sculpt that head using techniques that were unheard of in China. This is our first clear sign of an outside influence. From the maker's marks on the original warriors, they have identified just five separate workshops making the entire terracotta army. So the mass production of thousands of warriors could have been based on a combination of skilled Chinese potters guided by a small team of outside instructors. Is it possible those instructors came from the West? A few miles from the emperor's mausoleum lies his ancient capital city, Xi'an. It's really only in the last 20 years that China has opened up to the Western world. I mean, it's not hard to imagine how extraordinary it would have been for Westerners to find themselves here in the 3rd century BC. In a totally alien culture on the other side of the world. If that is what happened, it took someone of extraordinary vision to make it happen. China's first emperor, Qin Shi Huangdi. This was a revolutionary ruler who transcended all the boundaries of his age. In 221 BC, at the age of 40, he put an end to 250 years of war, conquering six neighboring states and forging the civilization we know today as China. This was the ancient foundation of the modern superpower. The emperor dreamt that his nation would last forever, and he wanted to stamp his mark on it. Yet if he recruited Westerners to help him create his mausoleum, bringing them here could have been one of the greatest challenges of his reign. There is no history of an established route in 3rd century BC connecting China with the West. The Silk Road is not mentioned by name for centuries. So did the emperor open this world-famous highway long before the history books acknowledge? Our only contemporary reference does suggest road building was one of the emperor's major priorities. 
Now, according to the Shiji, in 220 BC, after a tour of inspection over terrible, bumpy roads, the first emperor ordered the construction of a series of speedways radiating out from the capital. But is there any trace of that network? The Mausoleum's archaeology team has invited Albert to see a new excavation very close to the emperor's tomb. Uh, Lead archaeologist Zhang Wei Jing believes they've uncovered an ancient road. Peel this tarp back. At first sight, it looks narrow for an imperial highway. Okay. So, you know, when I first came in here, I thought that they were excavating the length of the road. I mean, it's, you know, it looks about the size of a road. But what we're seeing from the tracks is that actually the road is going this way. Oh, yeah. Oh, yeah, you really get a sense of it here. Okay. Zhang believes this is the cross-section of a vast multi-lane highway built to bring men and materials to the emperor's tomb. Towards the mausoleum. Okay, so... I, this was part of the, I guess, the construction process, you know. Wow, look at that. When you look at, you know, the size of that mound, it must have been a lot of material that was moved to build basically a mountain. These are the tracks of carts that have pressed down in the earth this Qin Dynasty over 2,000 years ago. The huge width of this highway shows the Chinese were masters of road engineering on a vast scale, capable of building the national network described in the Shiji. Perhaps reaching beyond China itself. We need to find that hidden network, which means Albert will need the latest aerial sensing technology. My own investigation, meanwhile, is gathering pace. The Terracotta Army gave us the first traces of possible Western input. But I've just come across a paper written by a German academic describing a set of terracotta figures whose bodies show unmistakable signs of a Western hand. No one knows what these figures are meant to be. The Chinese call them the acrobats. They were discovered in a small pit very close to the emperor's tomb, where I've arranged to meet Dr. Lucas Nickel. Ah, oh, Lucas, hi. Dan, nice hi. seeing you. It's very good to be here. I've read well, your paper. Have a look at this one. Here we have a figure with a semi-naked body. You know, he has just this little piece of cloth around his hip, and what we see is a building of a body. Yeah, you see, if you look at the arms, you know, we have a musculature, you know, yeah. we have an idea, an understanding of Ligaments the Ligaments in the hand, there. also Absolutely. big muscles over the kneecap. Yeah. If you remember, the terracotta warriors are basically standing that way. Yeah, yeah. It's like a torso with arms and legs just stuck in. But there's no attempt to build a proper working human body. There are believed to be more than 50 of these acrobats, and the conservation team is still trying to piece them together from thousands of fragments. Unlike the terracotta warriors, they're not made to a template. Each one appears to be individually sculpted by an experienced artist. This is now a totally different quality of sculpture. They want to show an anatomically correct movement. In a quite acceptable, believable way, he puts one foot in front, the other one behind, and you see that the whole body, the legs, the knees, the hip, and the upper part of the body are moving along. Your first impression on that is classically Greek. Yes, absolutely no question about that. It's something we only find in Greece. Only the Greeks would do that. 
the people who made this had an understanding of how Greeks would make sculpture. That is extremely surprising. To show a human body in this kind of convincing, lifelike stance, that is extremely complicated. That is something we know in Greece it had taken centuries to learn this. But suddenly, at the end of the third century, we see in China, we get that. And that is very close to a Greek idea. So you're seriously suggesting that that statue might have been sculpted by a Greek sculptor who came all the way out here and made it for the emperor? Well, I imagine a Greek sculptor may have come here to train the locals. It's just, that's, I mean, that's amazing. This feels like a huge breakthrough. Possible evidence of Western instructors working in China 2,200 years ago. Perhaps the same people who helped to create the terracotta army. But how did the emperor know where to find them? How did they get here? At the end of the 4th century BC, Alexander the Great bursts out of Greece here, out of Macedon, and conquers a huge empire in Asia. So Alexander the Great's empire reaches its high watermark around about the time of his death, 323 BC. Then, in, well, from 220 BC onwards, another young charismatic leader, Chen Shuangdi, creates the beginnings of modern China, unifying China. Now, did this first emperor of China take advantage of the narrow gap that now existed between the Greek world and his Chinese world to import ideas, techniques, materials, maybe even people? Suddenly, China doesn't seem so isolated. Albert is already planning his search for the road that might have bridged that gap. That's about a mile, right? So about a mile from here to here. While Alice is looking for the human evidence of foreigners who might have come here. So far, they've found more than 600 separate pits in this vast mausoleum complex. And one of the things they've discovered is that the emperor didn't just take terracotta figures to the next world. Real people were sacrificed to go with him. This skull is from one of 99 shallow graves, just north of the emperor's tomb, suggesting their occupants were very close to the emperor himself. The first revelation is that this skull, like all the others, belonged to a young woman. And Alice has found a passage in the Shiji that could explain their mass burial. Of the women in the harem of the former ruler, it would be unfitting to have those who bore no sons sent elsewhere. All were accordingly ordered to accompany the dead man, which resulted in the death of many women. If this skull belonged to one of those women, she was sacrificed for failing to give the emperor a son. Alice is going to see if she can find out more about this girl's life, as well as her untimely death. From lead archaeologist, Mr Zhu. So you think these bones could possibly be the female consorts of the emperor, the concubines? This they also have poignant evidence of how she lived. 
，所以这个墓主人身份应该是比较高贵的了，因为你看他这里面，因为大量的是珍珠，而且是金包珠，这个是。嗯。These pearls are absolutely beautiful, but we are looking at the jewelry that was worn by. A woman who lived in the third century BC, a woman who, during life, enjoyed a special position at court and high status. But she was killed, potentially brutally killed. And her only crime was to have been a concubine of the first emperor of China. This tragic story may yet have another twist. Before China was unified, local rulers used concubines to forge alliances with neighboring states through marriage. It's quite possible the first emperor took that idea beyond China's borders for the first time and brought in foreign concubines. The mausoleum is beginning a DNA study to try and trace the girl's origins. The problem is, unlocking those secrets could take many months. Alice's search for Westerners in China continues. Albert is ready to start his aerial search for the Emperor's road network. What we want to do is create a systematic, a systematic pass. So if this is... They're staying close to the tomb, where they already know that there was road construction. It's open field. Should we try it? Albert has borrowed a prototype, super-sensitive infrared camera. This is the first time it's ever been used in aerial archaeology. Over time. Oh, there we are at the very edge. Oh. And we're looking for a change in the temperature. The blue area is where it's a little bit colder. Mm. The red area is where it's a little bit warmer. And we're talking very subtle amounts here. Mm. The camera is able to pick up the faintest traces left deep in the earth by centuries of human disturbance. Albert adds this to satellite imagery creating a comprehensive deep time picture of the site. Nimi or Mayor Damien excavate. And right away there is something that Zhang hasn't seen before. Damien, you can take a loo. Take a loo. Hansha loo. A diagonal line on the landscape. It just doesn't seem to belong. So you're saying that if this is man-made, then it's a game changer. Really exciting. Could this be the first sign of the road network? The only way to know is to get out into the field and do a ground survey to make sure that what Albert's seen from above is nothing obviously modern like a sewer pipe or gas line. All right. Let's go take a look. This is really cool. It's clearly not a pipeline. In fact, it doesn't seem to have any obvious use. At least, not anymore. standing right now is right here. And what I didn't know until just this moment 
was what this was. But now I'm standing here and what it is, is this massive trench over six feet below the surface of the rest of these farms with no real explanation for its existence. There's no reason to have this huge trench here. There's no river here, there's nothing else. But, and if I'm right, then what I'm standing on right here could be one of the roads, of the network of roads built by the first emperor. It's a breakthrough, but in the wrong direction. The new line goes northeast towards the interior of China. We need something heading northwest. So, it's back to the aerial data. There's this faint signature of some kind of anomaly that's running at northwest. You see that right there? It looks like it's meeting right at the same point. And it looks like it's the exact same feature that we just ground truth. What looks like to be a, another road here. And they're literally radiating out. Our big question is where would the western road be going to? And how far? The rest of that ancient road is buried under the modern landscape. But there is a natural line it could have followed 2,000 years ago, along the Wei River Valley. And there is a possible destination, described in the Shiji. The most western extent of the empire at the time was this town called Lin Tao. The Shiji describes it as a garrison town. You know, it was part of this, this story of of the Great Wall. The first emperor created the first Great Wall of China. Over 5,000 kilometers long, the wall's starting point and base of construction was at Lin Tao. It must have been a huge project. There's builders there, there's soldiers there. I mean, communication was key, and the roads that this person built, the first emperor, they were the the key to that communication. Okay. Albert, how's it going? Hey, Dan. What have you found? I'm actually seeing around the first emperor's tomb site a road going west. Really? Really? The farthest it would go that we would know of so far would be this town of Lin Tao, the most western extent of the entire empire. That is very interesting information. Congratulations. If there was a road going from here as far as Lin Tao, can we find any historic reference connecting Lin Tao to the West? What's great is there is actually another source that we've got. And it's, it's not often talked about, but it was just shown to me the other day, and it's absolutely fascinating. It says, in the 26th year of the emperor, which is about 220 BC, in Lin Tao, it said, Da Ren appeared. That's tall men. I love that description, tall men. They didn't have a word for statue. But this is the best bit, all dressed in foreign robes. How so, interesting. Statues. That is the, what would become known as the Silk Route through there. So Lin Tao is perfectly placed. That makes a lot of sense. And there's more written about these Lin Tao statues. Apparently, the emperor had giant copies made in bronze to adorn his palace in Xi'an. It says weapons from all over the empire were confiscated and melted down to be used in casting bells, bell stands, and 12 men made of metal. He's melting down all of those weapons and creating these statues as a symbol of his power over that empire. And it's straight out of the playbook of the great conquerors of the Mediterranean, the Alexanders, the Ramesses, erecting massive statues to reinforce their own might, dominance, and their legitimacy. Sadly, there are no traces left of the emperor's original bronze statues. But the story suggests he wanted the kudos of exotic foreign culture. And we may have discovered the origins of the sculptors who brought that culture to China. Thanks to a new discovery made by Dr. Lucas Nickel. Ever seen something comparable? That looks 
very familiar. Or that one. That is very similar to the, to the stuff we're seeing here at the Terracotta Army. Absolutely. I mean, this idea of realism and this idea to try to make a believable uh, figure, uh, that is totally comparable to what we see in China. That is a sculpture made in Khalchayan in Afghanistan, where the Greeks established a lot of cities at this time. What we have here, that's a local ruler who apparently employed Greek craftsmen to make sculptures for his palace. These Greek craftsmen had the idea, well, why not even moving further east to the Chinese, of which we know that they are extremely rich. And that's going on in, in what is now Afghanistan. I mean, that's not very, very far from here, really. It's about the same distance to Athens as it is to the Chinese capital, Xi'an. Albert believes he's found the start of the emperor's road network and his hunch that that network could go much further west seems to be correct. Hey, Albert, how are you doing? Good. Just seen some good stuff as well. Oh, yeah? Mm, some fun yeah. stuff. Uh, Lucas just showed me some extraordinary images of art from Afghanistan on the borders of modern-day China and on what would become known as the Silk Road. Well, looks quite familiar. Looks quite familiar. <laughs> I mean, we're not talking about people coming from Athens. We're talking from Afghanistan, Tajikistan here. Basically, what we're saying is that very similar art styles, very similar time frame, and a bunch of connection points between these two. You did. Bang. Bobbers. East and West. Cultural exchange. <laughs> <laughs> we know the emperor has Western-style statues created for his capital. We think there were itinerant Greek sculptors moving east to a city in what is now Afghanistan. And it seems there was probably a road linking Xi'an at least as far as Lin Tao. So a picture is emerging of a cultural highway between west and east, a prototype Silk Road. But the picture is not yet complete. Hello. Oh, hey, Alice, how are you doing? We've got archaeology, we've got a, a culture of, of art, techniques of, of art. What we don't have is any people. You're the people person. It would be nice to see some evidence. I'm headed now to the Shaanxi Institute of Archaeology. I'm hoping that I'm going to see some of the, the mausoleum workers' bones. I've talked to the archaeologists, and they've hinted that there might be some kind of Western connection there, so I'm really intrigued to have a look at them. The remains Alice is going to see were found several kilometres east of the Terracotta Army. They're believed to be tomb workers because they were buried in a mass grave of the same period, close to the remains of a pottery kiln. There's one skull in particular that I'm really intrigued to have a look at because it might offer some kind of connection to people outside of China. The Xiangxi Institute is the central depository for all human remains found in the emperor's mausoleum. Because of their sacred and sensitive nature, those remains are closely guarded and access rarely granted. According to the Shiji, the emperor brought 700,000 men from all across China and possibly beyond to build his mausoleum more than 20 times the number who built Egypt's Great Pyramid at Giza. And Professor Sun has evidence that the human cost was correspondingly high. Gosh, so do you think this would have gone round the neck? Yeah. Of these individuals? Yeah. So they're hardly willing workers. Would you consider them to be slaves? Criminal. Criminals? Yeah. Criminals who were then conscripted to come and work on the tomb. Yeah. And presumably executed. I mean, these are, these are young men. We presume this is not a natural death that they suffered. Among the mass victims of the emperor's brutal forced labor, there is one individual, according to Professor Sun, whose features don't look Chinese. <laughs> It is, it's quite intriguing to look at him. This doesn't really look like a typically East Asian skull. 
I'm looking for features which, which might be typical of an East Asian skull, and, and they're not there. Instead, this skull has got quite prominent nasal bones, and its cheekbones are different as well. They're not the, the flattened malars or cheekbones that I would expect to see. I think it would be fantastic if we could do a bit of further analysis on this skull. There's a tantalising possibility we could be looking at an outsider, perhaps from beyond China's western border. A simple DNA test would confirm it, but they won't let Alice take a sample. Precise cranial measurements are the only other option. What would be great is if we could reconstruct the face of this young man so that we can see what he would have looked like in life. Reconstructing the face involves weeks of digital recreation, building muscle groups onto a computer model of the skull. But the real scientific data lies in the skull itself. Alice is using a global database of skull types, which may help pin down the origins of our tomb worker. Albert logs on to witness the long-awaited reveal, and Alice and I get ready to greet our worker face to face. Here we go. Here it is. A moment of truth. I can't wait to see what this reconstruction looks like. Styrene sticking to him. Wow. Well, he, he does look incredibly realistic. What do you think, Albert? Camera's coming in for extreme close-up. The thing that sends little tingles up my spine is that this may be the closest we get to actually being in that moment, in that time. You know, this is one of the guys who actually built that entire tomb. It's quite incredible, isn't it? So look at this reconstruction. Having seen the skull in China, this is our best guess of what this man actually looked like in life. My analysis of the skull was quite interesting. I took lots of measurements of the skull when we were out in China and came out as very definitely not Western. He's not from the West. I see. Um, 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 Doesn't help um, us, does it? Doesn't help I... us. <laughs> it's not the smoking gun, tantalising. It would have been very nice to find a ginger bloke <laughs> in, in the Tomb of the First Emperor. But we would, we'd have been incredibly lucky, I suppose, to find the one skeleton amongst the tens of thousands that must be lying around there. The data puts our man outside mainland China, but in a vast area. From Afghanistan to the Pacific Islands. Plausible evidence that there may have been outsiders working on the tomb. And it supports the controversial theory that the first emperor could have imported foreigners and foreign ideas. There are always new discoveries coming out of this vast mausoleum site. And one of them has thrown us a new line of inquiry. Not in terracotta, but in bronze. And not of human figures, but animals. 46 bronze water birds were found in a pit north of the emperor's tomb, all beautifully arranged as though feeding at an ornamental pond. It's a type of bronze sculpture that appeared in China almost overnight. Nothing like it had been seen here before the first emperor. It's such a beautiful piece of sculpture. And it's not just a beautiful object. It might be the techniques for making it came from the West. The technique is called direct lost wax and its origins can be traced back to the Mediterranean 5,000 years ago. The 
Before I can talk to the researcher who has the key piece of evidence, I'm told I need to see the basic process to understand quite how complex it is. As the name suggests, they start with a design carved out of wax, then go through a series of processes to replace that wax with bronze. So this is a sort of mold that gets created around the wax. And it's this mold that will give the shape to the bronze. It's so clever. Lost wax took centuries to perfect in the West. And watching it today, I can understand why. So this is the big moment. It's all about to be put together. This is the action now. Wow, molten bronze. It's fascinating to watch, but how good are the results? Ooh, look at that. The bronze has taken the form of that wax absolutely perfectly. So they're going to cut these off, stick a head on it, and you've got a wonderful bird, fit for an emperor. Ah, hot. It's clear this process is too complex to stumble on by accident. But did someone bring a version of it to China 2,000 years ago? According to Dr. Xiao and Ding, there is telltale evidence of the direct lost wax technique. It's hidden inside this swan's graceful, delicate neck. A reinforced structural core of clay. This is evidence core like that, isn't it? Yeah. So if you want to create these very natural shapes, you need like a reinforcing rod running through it to give it that shape. Yeah. If you don't have this uh, core rod, rod, it will just snap off. Yeah, yeah. Xiao only discovered the core rod when he x-rayed the swan. Oh, there you go. <laughs> Is that the rod? Yes, yes. Perfect. It's the evidence of the rod. That's yeah. very clear. Yes. So that's like, that's the reinforcing rod on an x-ray. Such kind of evidence we haven't seen in Chinese bronze before. We see the similar scenes in Egypt bronze sculpture. In Egypt? Yes, Egypt bronze kite. Wow. I can show you. No. Look at that. Yes. That's uncanny. It's got the reinforcing rod there. Yes, yes, yes. This so one is the same techniques with the neck. So you're saying this technique was normal in the Mediterranean and never been seen before in China? Yeah, we, we haven't seen it. But in this group of birds, the technique is perfect. So I think it's influenced or borrowed directly from the West. Wow. That's pretty good evidence. <laughs> We now have strong evidence of Western metal workers in China in the third century BC. Added to the evidence of Greek trained sculptors, it suggests there was a community of Westerners brought here by the emperor. But unlike terracotta, when it came to bronze, the Chinese took imported technology to a whole new level. In the heart of the mausoleum is a gallery showcasing the genius of the emperor's bronze workers. Objects like these. Two half-size replicas of imperial carriages made entirely of bronze. I don't think I've ever seen anything so beautiful of this antiquity. Over 2,000 years, this remained underground. It's so lifelike. You can feel the energy in those horses. I love the fact that it's just waiting, key in the ignition, ready for the emperor to rise in the afterlife, take his position, and be taken off to visit his new underground kingdom. We're getting a clearer and clearer picture of how the emperor used Western techniques to enhance his newly unified empire. And creating the physical infrastructure to connect to communities far beyond his borders. 
but we haven't yet found evidence of Western people. However, Alice has heard about a new study of human remains from around the time of the first emperor. And she's meeting its author, geneticist Josh Juji. Hello, Alice. Hello, Josh. Nice Hello. to meet you. Really nice to meet you. Have a seat. Thank you. They have the European specific mitochondrial DNA. The U. Oh, mitochondria yeah. U. And uh, most of them are U. So, so you cave. on my map here is yeah. something which is much more common, much more frequent in, in Europe. Europe. Uh -huh. Definitely European looking. So yeah. this is really intriguing. This this must be evidence at some point then of people with European mitochondrial DNA uh -huh. coming into Asia. It, it looks like uh, some uh, Western uh, Europeans travel there and settle down and die there. It does make you wonder if this is evidence of people moving along a kind of preto silk route. Yes. This DNA evidence was found here en route to China and within its current border. It's news Alice needs to share. So I just met up with Josh, who is the first author on uh, this fantastic paper from Xinjiang province. Right, uh, where, where the Silk Road is, basically. Yes, yeah. OK, so right over in the west of China. And there they found a real mixture, European mitochondrial DNA lineages mixed up with East Asian lineages. So this, this goes back kind of to the time of the whole Alexander the Great conquest and... Yeah, yeah, yeah. Wow. And, um, a, and a real mixture of people. I would think that there's been an inspiration across the two worlds that we haven't fully accounted for. We began our journey with a simple question. What could explain the terracotta army? There was one explanation that was earth-shattering in its implications. A direct link with the Western world centuries before it was thought possible. This is the Western end of that connection. The British Museum's collection of classical Greek sculpture. Is it possible that the people that learned the skills that created these masterpieces helped to forge the legacy of the first emperor of China? The experts certainly think so. That's a possibility. They really have some other culture stimulation. This understanding of sculpture was absolutely extraordinary. I believe Greek sculpture makers moved all the way to the Chinese capital and sold their trade to the first emperor. And not just in terracotta. I think it's influenced or borrowed directly from the West. We have evidence of an ancient road network that could have brought Westerners to China and DNA evidence of Europeans living on China's doorstep. Archaeological evidence show they really have communications between the East and the West. I think this story rewrites the history of the birth of China, today one of the most powerful nations on Earth. And it totally revolutionizes our understanding of relations between East and West 2,000 years ago. But perhaps most importantly of all, it provides vital context that deepens and enriches our relationships in the present day.